Our kind and loving Father, we just want to thank you so much, Lord, for your mercies. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, especially for the gift of Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, that as we are about to look at your word, please may you teach us and may we truly see that the remedy for our defective characters is found in looking at Jesus. Please may you bless us, teach us, and help us to see truly, Lord, we don't have much time left. Please have mercy upon us and abide with us. We invite your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Blessed Sabbath Church. Um, what I want us to look at is a chapter, part of what I believe is present truth now is Daniel 11. Do you believe that Daniel 11 is very important for us in our time? Are we now living in the fulfillment of Daniel 11? But before, maybe before we go there and before we introduce where we're going fully, I want us just to look at something, maybe before we go into our study completely. I want us to look at this quotation. Now, we all, are we all not striving for victory over sin? Does this say something we want? And sometimes we feel the weakness of the human flesh. But I want, us to, I want us to see a quotation. And from this quotation, I want you to tell me, I'm going to read it. I want you to tell me, according to this quotation, what is the only power sufficient enough to break the spell of sin? I'm going to read a quotation. I want you to tell me, what does it say? Let's see. Uh oh. Okay. I'm reading from Desire of Ages 671. Father, please bless these words, for we have opened them in Jesus' name. Amen. Desire of Ages 671. Here what the woman of God says. She says, The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries. As, do you think that the power of evil is strengthening even today? Yeah. Do you think as we are nearing the end, temptation is going to become weaker and weaker? Is it going to become stronger and stronger? It's going to become stronger. So do you know the temptation today is not going to be as, what I'm saying, it's not going to be as weak tomorrow. Today it might be weak, but tomorrow is coming even stronger. But do you know that every time we resist the Spirit of God, He becomes weaker? It's the opposite. Temptation becomes stronger and every resistance of the Spirit do you know that it becomes weaker tomorrow? What I mean is this, the convictions of the Spirit today will not be as strong tomorrow. Inspiration says in Desire of Ages. She says every resistance of the Spirit of God, she says actually strengthens or hardens our hearts against Him. And though He may come with the same power the next day, even more power, our, our, our eyes become blinded, our heart becomes hardened. Do you know that God, every time He demonstrated His power to Pharaoh, do you know that Pharaoh's heart became harder and harder and harder? Do you know that our hearts is just, what I can say is this, that God's power upon our hearts is same like the sun. The sun, I'm saying the sun that shines, that gives off heat, light. Do you know that that same sun can have different effects upon different things? Yeah. Do you know what it does to wax that same sun and melts wax? Do you know what it does to clay that same sun and hardens it? We decide what kind of heart we're going to have. Same power of God, but we decide what, what it's going to do to us. Now, hear what she says. She says, the power of evil has been strengthening for centuries. And the submission of men to the satanic captivity was amazing. Then she says, listen to this, sin could be resisted and overcome. And then she says, what's that next word? Only. Through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come, with, would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. So if I'm going to resist sin, according to this quotation, what is the power, the only power, she says, is the power that can help us resist sin. But you know how she, introduced, she says, the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, that's the Holy Spirit. So... My question to you, what is the only thing that's going to cause us to gain victory over sin according to this quotation? Holy Spirit. 
But do you know there is something, I say this very humbly and respectfully, there is something that can overpower the Spirit of God. One sin. <laughs> it can overpower the Spirit of God. I'm saying that from the very beginning of the great controversy, we have seen the sin. Even when you see, Pi you know, friends, I want us to look at Pilate. And I want you to see, when Pilate had Jesus in the judgment hall, I want you to see the woman of God says something interesting when she's speaking of Pilate. She says something about Pilate. She actually says he missed this golden opportunity. And I want you to see what caused Pilate to miss this golden opportunity for salvation. Listen to the quotation. She says, yeah, I'm going to read it, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, 131. She says, Pilate turned to Jesus when Jesus was in the judgment hall. And in a respectful voice asked him, Are thou the king of the Jews? Jesus did not directly answer this question. He knew that conviction was awakened in the heart of Pilate, and he wished to give him opportunity to acknowledge as far, acknowledge how far his mind has been influenced in the right direction. So when Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus never directly answered him the second time. He wanted, to, he wanted him to acknowledge his own personal conviction that Pilate was getting, Pilate was getting convictions, that Jesus is truly a king. But then it continues, he therefore answered, saying, Jesus answered, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Let's pause. Are you hearing what Jesus is asking him? Are you hearing what Jesus is asking Pilate? Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says, do you say this thing of yourself? In other words, are you acknowledging me as a king? Can you see that I am a king? Or are you only asking because others have told you I'm a king? So he's asking Pilate, are you seeing it? And Pilate was seen he was a king. But let's see what, what happens. It says, the Savior wished a statement from Pilate whether his question arose from the accusations just made by the Jews or from his desire to receive light from Christ. Pilate longed for a more intelligent faith, the dignified bearing of Jesus and his calm self-possession when placed in a position where there would be naturally be developed a spirit of hate and revenge, astonish Pilate and won his deep respect. The direct question just asked him by Jesus was immediately understood by him. So when Jesus asked the question, the Pilate understand what Jesus is saying. What, what, what does it say? He immediately understood what Jesus was saying. Do you say I'm the king of the Jews because you can see I'm a king? Or you were saying it because others told, it of you, told this about me to you? And then she says, where did I stop? It says the direct question Jesus, or the direct question just asked by, by Jesus was immediately understood by him, which evidence that his soul was stirred by conviction. But listen to this. But pride rose in the heart of the Roman judge and overpowered the Spirit of God. Let's stop there. I want, I want you to get the lesson. Before I go further, what is the only agency that can help me, the most powerful agency to help me overcome sin? Holy Spirit, the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead. But here when Pilate was given the test, basically Jesus is saying, do you acknowledge me as a king? What arose within the heart of Pilate that overpowered the spirit of God, the mightiest agency to help me resist sin? Pride. What did pride do to the spirit of God? It overpowered the spirit of God. It says, Pilate answered, am I a Jew? In other words, I'm not acknowledging you as no king. Am I a Jew? Then it says, Pilate continues, he says, Thine own nation and chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Here was the next sentence says, Ellen White concludes. She says, Pilate's golden opportunity had passed. His probation there and there closed. What is it that brought Pilate to the threshold of his probation and closed it for him? Pride. 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 Did pride overcome the spirit of God? Did she say that? Can I ask you a question? What was it? What was it 
that brought Lucifer. Do you know that Lucifer was almost convinced to repent of his sin? Inspiration says in Patriarchs and Prophets. She says he was almost convinced he was on the, he was on the brink of repenting of his sin and going back to God and confessing I was wrong. I want you to see what she says in Patriarchs and Prophets. She says, what forbade him to do this? I'm reading from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. Please write these things down. Go back and reread them. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. Did I say 36? Yes. You know what? I think it's, let's go to page 37. Page 37. She says, speaking about Lucifer, she says, leaving his place in the immediate presence of the Father, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirits. Mm. Oh, friends, was that the right one? Actually, it's page 39. I'm so sorry. Scratch that one out. But read the whole chapter. The whole chapter is powerful. She says, now, let me say this. Before Lucifer rebelled, was there ever sin in the universe? No. no. Question, when Lucifer rebelled, did Lucifer knowingly rebel? Yes. That's not what inspiration teaches. That's not what inspiration teaches. She says Lucifer did not see he did not understand this rebellion that was taking place within his heart. She says he could not see things very clearly. But she says, I'm going to read it now. But she says a time came now when everything became clear to him. And he realized he was on the wrong. You listen to the quotation. She says, in great mercy, according to his divine character, God bore along with Lucifer. The spirit of discontent and this affection had never before been known in heaven. It was a new element, strange and mysterious, unaccountable. Hear what she says now. Lucifer himself had not at first been acquainted with the real nature of his feelings. Are you hearing what she's saying? He was not acquainted with the real nature of his feelings. He did not understand what's happening. She says here, yeah, for a time he had feared to express the workings and imaginations of his mind. Yet he did not dismiss them. So he didn't understand what was going on in his heart, this, this, this battle that was going on in his mind. He couldn't understand. But at the same time, she says, he was fearful to express it in the beginning, but he also did not want to dismiss it. So what was he doing? He was lingering with temptation. He lingered with it. And sometimes, you know, th that's what we do. We linger with temptation, and then next minute we look, oh, boom. Do you know what Eve, what her failure was? She lingered with temptation in the garden. We cannot, we cannot have all conversations with Satan. His own mind deceived him. His own mind deceived him. Now, hear what she continues to say. Do you, question, do you think God understood this about Lucifer? I'm saying when, when this was happening, that God understands, Lucifer understands everything what he's doing, or that God see, does not see clearly where his feet tending. God saw it. So God was, that's why she starts the sentence by saying God bore long with Lucifer. He was very long because he understood even though he was causing dis disaffection amongst the angels, God could see. The spin does not see what he's doing fully and clearly. And so God bore long with him. Is this a lesson for us? The Je question, did Jesus have a disciple in whom he said that one of you is the devil? Did he bear long with that disciple? But question, was there a time when God cut off Lucifer? Was there a time when he cut off Judas? Yes. But can we see the odds to cut off? <laughs> we can't see the odds, so there's no cutting off for us. Now let's continue. <laughs> it says, he did not see whether he was drifting. So Lucifer never see where he was drifting. She continues, she says, but such efforts as infinite love and wisdom could devise were made to convince him of his error. His disaffection, were his disaffection was proved to be without cause, and he was made to see what would be the result of persisting in revolt. God showed him now the results of persisting in revolt, that if he continues revolting, there's going to be consequences. And then she says, Lucifer, yeah, this, Lucifer was convinced that he was in the wrong. So he's still in heaven. He has went, he sowed discord amongst the angels. Angels have sided with him. But now she says, oft he does all this discord in heaven. Angels have, have broken up. Now, only now, she says, Lucifer is convinced of his error. Now he only sees what I've done. I've just caught chaos in heaven. 
Now watch this now. You know what comes within his heart? Go and repent to God. Acknowledge you are wrong. Because now he sees it for the first time, I'm wrong. Watch this. And the Bible says there's nothing new what? Under the sun. What has been? Shall be. What I'm going to suggest is that same sin that Lucifer struggled with, the same sin that closed the probation for Pilate, closed probation for Pilate, and overpowered the Spirit of God, is going to be the downfall of every person who's lost. You know what I'm saying? Everyone was lost. The root of their problem is going to be the same issue that Pilate had, the same issue Lucifer had. I'm going to show you it publicly. But let's finish this quotation. It says here, he saw, Lucifer saw, that the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works, that the divine statutes are just, and that he ought to acknowledge them as such before all heaven. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Do you know that had Lucifer done this, what I'm about to read, do you know that we wouldn't be here right now? I'm saying we wouldn't be worshipping like this. We would be worshipping in God's presence today. Literally, I know God's amongst us, but literally we would be seeing God face to face. There would have been no rebellion in the universe. Listen to what she says. Listen to what she says. Had he done this, in confessing, acknowledging to God he was wrong, had he done this, he might have saved himself and many angels. He had not, he had not at that time fully cast off his allegiance with God. Though he had left his position as covering cherub, yet if he had been willing to return to God and acknowledge the Creator's wisdom and satisfied to fill the place appointed him of God in God's great plan, he would have been reinstated in his office. So even after all that chaos, had he repented, God would have given him his position back as covering cherub. Now listen to this. He, Lucifer, nearly reached the decision to return but pride forbade him. It was too great a sacrifice for one who had been so highly honored to confess that he had been in error, that his imaginations were false, and to yield to the authority which he had been working to prove unjust. What does she say? He, she says here, interesting, he nearly reached the decision to return. Like he, he was about to do it. Like he was almost taking the steps towards God, but something stood up before him. She says, pride forbade him. Think of it. Because of his rebellion, how many people are going to be lost? Not only him, not only the angels, but do you know that millions, billions of wicked people, because Lucifer had a problem with what? Pride. Pride forbade him. Pride forbade him. I'm going to suggest this, friends. Do you know, I'm going to say this. Oh, friends, come with me to Malachi 4. I want you to see something. You know what? Let's go to Malachi 4. Come with me to Mal Malachi. is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. You know what? Before Malachi 4, did I say Malachi 4? Come with me to Job. Let's go to Job. I want you to see something in Job before Malachi. And then I want to pause. I want to introduce something, then I pause and pray. Come with me to Job. Where are we going to? What chapter? Oh, okay. <laughs> We're going to Job chapter 41. Job 41. Job chapter 41. Now, as you're going to Job 41, I want you to look at the screen. The screen. Job 41, I want you to look at the screen. Now, you tell me. You tell me. I want you to tell me. We're about to read Job 41. But before I read Job 41, I want you to tell me. Tell me what is the most... What is the most dangerous and I could put the incurable sin? Listen to what she says. Christ Object Lessons 154. She says there is nothing so offensive to God. Now, you know what's offensive? Uh, do you know what's, does anybody know what's offensive? What, what is offensive? Offensive. What is something that's offensive? Can you upset somebody or upset somebody? Or upset, do something wrong? Offensive. Anything more? Yes, that's, that's true. Offensive. Any disturbing, okay? Disturbing something that is offensive is disturbing. Okay, disregard. But if I say, if something's offensive to you, how how do you feel about that thing? 
Hearts, okay, hearts is a good word. Offensive. You don't like dislike. It's a dislike, right? You're giving good answers. <laughs> Offensive is something that it's like you almost you 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 yeah you despise the stain. Listen to what she says. There's nothing so offensive to God. Now, if you love God, I'm saying if you love God, there's two things you should do. I'm saying if you love God, you should find out what best pleases Him, and then try and do those things. And then you should also understand what is of, what does God what does the person I love what doesn't He like. Inspiration is saying, this is the thing that he hates the most, which is the most offensive to God. In other words, now God wants you to do anything wrong, but he says that this thing, if anything wrong is done, this thing, God really, really, he, he, it's offensive to him. What is this thing? There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as, what's that word? As pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, of how many sins? Of all sins, it is the most hopeless, the most incurable. What sin is the most hopeless? That means if, if, this, is, if this is the thing that I'm cherishing, inspiration says you're in the most hopeless condition. It is the most incurable. Like God can cure the drunkard, he can cure the person that's struggling with cigarettes, he can cure the man that realizes I am struggling here. Yeah. But you know that pride does not feel no need. Pride does not, pride looks at himself and says, I'm good. Heaven is my home. Pride does not see it needs to humble itself before God. The most incurable, she says, the most incurable and most hopeless is what? Pride of all sins. Of all sins. What is it? Pride. Pride. What is the thing that overpowered the spirit of God in Pilate's life? Pride. Are we in Job 41? I want you to see Job chapter 41. Job 41. I want you to look at verse 34. It's speaking about Lucifer, Satan. Speaking about Satan. You tell me, who is Satan the father of? (sighs) Are you seeing that? Job 41 verse 34. It says, he, that Satan, beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all children of pride. Bible says that if we have pride, Satan is our king. Not Jesus. Satan. Satan. Friends, I'm saying, inspiration is teaching us, the most incurable sin we are looking at, most incurable, inspiration says, most incurable and most hopeless, we are looking at this sin, pride. I want us to look at this very, very in depth. I'm going to pause and pray. I want us to look at this issue and what we're going to see publicly, oh friends, out of all sins, God, I'm saying out of all sins, the most deadliest of them all is this one sin. It's pride. And we're going to show publicly that everyone was lost, everyone, everyone was found outside the city of God. When God describes the wicked, every wicked person, he uses one word to describe all of them. He says, the proud shall be burned. That's how he describes every wicked person outside, from their father, Lucifer, to every, the least of them. He describes them all with pride. Even in the, not yes. the LGBT, the mm. pride man. Yes. Yes, abomination. You know what? Why do you want that? Why do you want that? What do they call it? Right. LGBT. Let me ask you this. What was Sodom and Gomorrah? What, what was the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm saying literally, what was their sin? Oh what is it? Come with me to Ezekiel 16. Wait! Ezekiel 16. Wait, 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 wait. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16. Since seeing that subject was brought out, let me go there now. Ezekiel chapter 16. Now I'm giving you all the end of my study. This was my end of my study. But I'm giving you the end before the beginning. Just in case I don't have enough time. (laughs) Ezekiel 16. (laughs) Ezekiel chapter 16. This is the conclusion of our study. I'm giving you the conclusion. Ezekiel chapter 16. Verse 49. 
Uh, that's as he's saying idol. Ezekiel 16. Idol. All right, so we are in idol. Wonderful. Ezekiel 16. Watch this verse 49. What destroys Sodom and Gomorrah? Behold, Ezekiel 16, 49. This was the iniquity of thy system, Sodom. What's that word? Pride. Why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Pride. How was it demonstrated by it? homosexuality? The root of homosexuality, publicly speaking, was pride. What I'm saying is God saying why I destroyed them was because of pride. Their pride led them to commit the sin of homosexuality. Pride can lead us to commit the sin of dressing inappropriate. There's pride of dress. Pride can lead us to having a perverted appetite. Pride can lead us, what I'm saying is pride, pride can re- lead me to make my opinions an idol. Friends, yes. Oh, then pray. A proud. The, the Lord Lucifer was brought to the point of almost being it, but pride forbade him. You can't submit. You're too great. You can't do it. Because even with the, his LGBT people, the, the spirit that convinced him. Is yes. Wrong. Yeah. This is me and I'll be this. Pride. Pride. It's pride. It is pride. It is pride. I want to pause and pray. I want to pause and pray. What? You know what? Before I pause and pray, I want you to see something. Let's read, let's read this quotation. I'm giving you... What I'm looking at you now is the conclusion of the matter. This is the conclusion of my study. Even these quotations are right at the end. But let's look at it and then I want to come, reverse and start again. And then come to this point. Now listen to what she says. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, 337. Now it's called Testimonies for the Church. So who was this written for? If it's called Testimonies for the Church, that means it was written for me and it was written for you. Now listen to what it says. God does not regard, what's that next word? All All sins as equal magnitude. Pause. Does God regard all sins as equal magnitude? No. No. If I should say to you, if I should say this to you, that that man drinking there outside, I'm just making this up, man drinking outside somewhere there and smoking cigarettes, smoking whatever. If I tell you this, that that man is in a better condition than us inside the church who have pride within our hearts, would you believe me? I'm going to read a quotation now. We're going to see inspiration says the man, the drunkard is despised. He's told he's not going to heaven. And that's true. A man who continues continuing in a part of wrong, he's not going to go there. But he says, sins go unrebuked, which are more dangerous than the drunkard. And then she mentions the three most deadliest sins in this world. And especially amongst professed seventh the Adventists, me and you. You know what she says? You want to say something, right? Yeah, what I was going to say, that's why God uh, left Lucifer to continue. Mm. To Stand. Yes. Yes. To yes. Likewise, what you were saying, the one that don't know what he's doing God. God is almost. He's almost yeah. merciful because he understands this man. And you know what? What this is. This is the difference. The man who's drinking can acknowledge, "I am drinking, but I need help from God. Mm. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm addicted." Whereas a prideful person, he doesn't see I'm in need of God. He doesn't see I'm struggling with this. I'm, he looks at himself like heaven's my home. Should Jesus come? Should I'm ready? All is well. He does not see the great defects in his life. And almost a prideful person will try and point out he has an issue here. What? I don't see that. You, there's a problem with you. That's what the, the, later seeing Jesus, the man, the, Jesus himself says, the true witness says, you are blind, naked, wretched, miserable, poor. The church says we are rich and increased with goods. We have need of nothing. In other words, Jesus is telling him, this is your condition. And they're saying to the one who knows all things, no, you're wrong. We are in a better condition than what you think. And the Laodicean church is the seventh-day Adventist church. It's me and you. Jesus says, this is wrong with you. And we say, Mm-mm, not me. It's this person. Pride does not see its need. Now, let's read this quotation. Now, friends, I'm giving you the conclusion. Now, your you're, you're, you're conscious say, I see the issue. I'm showing you there's a problem. But I, a true doctor, a true physician, a medical missionary, he doesn't just diagnose the person and tell him, you've you, you got a deadly disease, you've got two months to live. A true medical missionary says, there is a remedy. 
So I'm showing you the problem first, then I'm going to pause and pray. And then we're going to deal with the remedy. What I'm going to suggest is, let me tell you now, the remedy for pride, I'm going to suggest the remedy for pride is found in the loud cry. So guess what we're going to have to study? The loud cry. Now the loud cry, another name for the loud cry is the fourth angel's message. Have you ever heard of that angel? So we're going to have to go here. Now, before I go there, let's finish this quotation. Then I'm going to show you, oh, beloved, do you understand what's happening with Ukraine and Russia now? NATO. Do you un- Oh, friends. I'm going to, sh- you know, by God's grace, we're going to show. Do you know that Luke predicted this war that's taking place? The book of Luke. But he doesn't predict it merely a prediction. Luke does it in such, in such order. Like he gives us, this must happen, this must happen, this must happen. And then Luke says, boom, war. And then he says, immediately mock of the beast. Powers of the heavens will be shaken. Second coming of Jesus. We're going to show you. But interesting, he mentions this war. We're going to see that Daniel speaks of. Luke mentions it. Do you understand what's happening now? Remember I showed you last week, Bill Gates says another pandemic is, I must be careful of using even his name, video gets pulled down. That man, the junior antichrist, you know what he says? That very soon, a new pandemic, pestilence is coming worse than the current one. Now, (laughs) can I come back to this quotation? Because I'm tempted now. I'm tempted. Can I come back to the quotation? <laughs> I'm tempted. I want to show you that it was just found now by the Russians and nations are now calling America to give an account for what they're doing. It was just found now in this week that they were bio... bio what's the word for this thing? When you make up diseases and you use it as a weapon, What's the name? Give me a name. Um, okay, can I come back to this quotation? Let, let's come back to it. Let's come back to it. <laughs> Watch this. Watch this. It says here, Mr. Gates warns of deadly new pestilence, even worse than the current pestilence, as he inv- invests what? Into a new, don't mention the word, poison. Now think of it. Is this a businessman? You don't invest money into something you know there's no return. You must already know there's going to be a huge return. Have you ever heard of order out of chaos? You create the chaos and then you come with the solution. Now someone might argue and say there's no such of that. But do you know inspiration teaches order out of chaos? I'm not saying that God stands for order. That's Satan's method. Remember Great Controversy 590, 590, uh, 589, 590. While speaking of Satan, while he appears to the children of men as a great physician who can heal their melodies, what does he do? He brings disease and disaster. So he appears that he's going to heal everyone, but what does he do? He brings the disease, he brings the disaster, and then he appears as a great physician. What would you call that? Order out of chaos. You create the chaos, and then you come with the order. But it's a false system, a false order of system, a false system. Now, again, Mr. Gates warns of another pandemic has come in. Now, there's a quotation in Great Controversy 589. This is the same quotation I just quoted from. 589, Great Controversy 589. Now, someone will ask me, what I'm going to say is, I, I believe what, what he says is true. What Mr. Gates is saying, that another pandemic is coming worse than, than, than this current one, is, I believe it's true. You said something? Does anybody believe it? what he's saying is true? Yeah. Why do you believe that? Okay, but I'm saying inspiration. Does inspiration teach us that it's going to become, that it's going to be, what does it say? Great Controversy 590, it says Satan pours into the, air, into the air deadly taint and thousands perish by the pestilence. Then the very next sentence, these disasters are to become more and more frequent. So she says in pots were air, deadly taint, and thousands perished by the pestilence. That's a sickness. And then she says, these visitations are to become more frequent and more disastrous. So as we are nearing the end, things must not decrease, but what? Increase. Now, 
I want you to see what she says before that quotation. Because immediately in Great Controversy, as she mentions that, the very next thing she says is a Sunday law. Now, here, this quotation, 589, she says, Satan delights in what? So, question, who was behind the Ukraine-Russian war today? Satan. Satan. Would you agree? Does inspiration say that? But I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to give you evidence who is behind it. It's the man of sin. I'm going to show you a video of Joe Biden when he was young. In politics, he said, should we take Ukraine into NATO, we're going to agitate Russia to war. I'm going to show you a video when he's young. And he said that. And then I'm going to show you, he goes and he visits the Vatican. Not long after that. Oh, friends, I'm going to tell you, nothing happens by accident. Watch the quotation. Satan delights in war. Why? For he excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another. For he can thus divert the mind of the people from the work of preparation to stand in the day of God. And then she says, next sentence, please, 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 beloved. What does she say here? Yeah? Number one, what does Satan do according to this? I just read the quotation. What does he delight in? So it's war. And then what comes, what, what next? In the midst of war, what next? Blue words, blue words. Satan works through the elements also to corner in a harvest of unprepared souls. He studied in the secrets of the laboratories of nature. What, what is that? Where does he study? In labs. What comes out of labs? What happens in laboratories? What's studied in laboratories? What's looked at in laboratories? Because then she immediately she mentions pestilence, disease, disease. Now, I want you to watch this. Please watch this, beloved. What was found in Ukraine? They were destroying documents in Ukraine as it was announced that Russia is about to invade Ukraine. What did the Ukrainians destroy? And what documents have the Russians found that was inside Ukraine? Please watch carefully. The Russian Ministry of Defense has accused Ukraine of allegedly developing a biological weapons program assisted by the U.S. A spokesman claimed Russian forces... Bio did you hear that? Biological weapons. Who was it assisted by? The United States. Let's, let's rewind that. Let's rewind that. The Russian Ministry of Defense has accused Ukraine of allegedly developing a biological weapons program assisted by the U.S. A spokesman claimed Russian forces had apparently discovered documents concerning the urgent destruction of all traces of the project. Let's pause. What happened? They had to de what did they want to do? Destroy all traces of the project. During the special military operation, we discovered evidence of the Kiev regime's urgent destruction of traces of a military biological program implemented in Ukraine and funded by the U.S. Department of Defense. We have received documentation from employees of Ukrainian biological laboratories concerning the urgent destruction on February 24 of highly dangerous pathogens of plague, anthrax, tularemia, cholera and other deadly diseases on February 24. Well, we've been hearing from the spokesperson for the Russian Ministry of Defense saying that while they were conducting their operations in Ukraine, they came across evidence that proves that there was a biological program being conducted in Ukraine with the assistance of the American Department of Defense. Now, among the evidence they found is a whole cachet of documents that they're currently reviewing and they are analyzing and will release in the nearest future. But what we understand amongst those documents is confirmation that these Ukrainian biochemical laboratories that were close to Russian territory were involved in this biological program. And apparently we're talking here about pathogens of plague, anthrax, tularemia, cholera, and other deadly diseases. At the same time, there seems to have been a, a major panic when the Russian operation started in Ukraine because there are documents that are dated February the 24th that call for the immediate destruction of any kind of stockpiles or any kind of evidence that pinpoints and shows that this was happening. Now, we know that obviously when the Russian military operation started, there would have been panic in the Pentagon to try and hide any kind of evidence. 
documents. And one of the documents that has already been released by the Russian Ministry of Defense comes from the Ukrainian Health Ministry, and it explicitly calls on all kinds of biological laboratories in Ukraine to immediately get rid of any kind of evidence that they have. So this is the document. And before we take a look, are you hearing that? So they were they were prepared. All lot of diseases. They were basically, I would say, what do you call it? Genetically modifying these diseases. When you take genetically modified, when you take a bad disease, you genetically modify it and you make it now infect human beings. Mm -hmm. So this is what they were operating, this is what they were currently doing within Ukraine. And as soon as Russia started invading, the, 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 it was given quickly, destroy all documents. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what is interesting? Before Russia even started invading, before they started announcing what they have found, do you know that there were articles saying fact check that there's no operations like this taking place. Now, before, think of this, before the Russians came out and said this, there was articles saying there's no such. Pentagon, even up to today, is denying it. But you know, we know this true. What do you call this? A foreign minister? The foreign minister for Ukraine, or the one in the United States that is in contact with Ukraine, when questioned in a Senate hearing, do you know that she confessed? Now, I want you to see, I want you to see. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. If you had told us just four days ago that the Biden administration was funding secret bio labs in Ukraine of all places, we would not have believed you. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna put that on TV, no thanks. Then if you told us that not only did the administration fund these secret bio labs in Ukraine, but that they then failed to secure the deadly contents of those labs before the Russian invasion, an invasion they knew was coming, an invasion they helped encourage. If you had told us that four days ago, we would have dismissed you as a nut. It was just too preposterous. We would not want anything to do with a story like that. There was no way it could be true. It's too far out. In any case, we already knew for a fact that that story was false. How do we know that? Because we read USA Today, America's newspaper. Within hours of the Russian invasion, USA Today published a rebuttal to all those crazies who are yammering on about secret Ukrainian bio labs. Here was the headline. Fact check. False claim of U.S. bio labs in Ukraine tied to Russian disinformation campaign. So if you look carefully at the story, and we did because we were interested, you notice that this fact check was sourced to Ukrainian government unnamed officials and then Biden State Department officials. So these were not exactly objective sources on the- Just pause there. Are you seeing that? There was already articles coming out to say there's nothing happening in Ukraine, in Ukraine. But let's continue listening. This subject, but still, the story seemed definitive. It was totally emphatic. Quote, Russia has teamed up with China to further amplify the false claim of US labs in Ukraine. Okay, USA Today says it's Russian disinformation. Maybe it is. On to the next story. But the fact checks didn't stop. That was weird. We kept seeing the same fact check again and again. It was almost like, despite endless official clarification, some people refused to believe the Biden administration. They preferred Russian propaganda instead. And we assume they must be QAnon members. We assume that because Foreign Policy magazine told us that. According to Foreign Policy, QAnon, whatever that is, was frantically disseminating, quote, false claims of U.S. biowarfare labs in Ukraine. Those labs obviously didn't exist. It was all just another lie from the Russians who lie for a living. Then the European Union weighed up, weighed in, throwing its credibility behind the same claim. These are conspiracy theories, the EU told us. They're lies spread by Putin. An EU spokesman then reminded us that, quote, the credibility of information provided by the Kremlin is in general very doubtful and low. And that was good to know. Quote, Russian disinformation has a track record of promoting manipulative narratives about biological weapons and alleged secret labs. Yeah, we're not going to Are you seeing now European, many articles are coming out saying that no such thing is happening. Now watch this. You know, the best person to speak to is the person inside the United States who has connection with the, the foreign minister, so to speak, from the United States with Ukraine. I want you to see when she was questioning the Senate, what did she say? I'm going to do a segment about secret labs in Ukraine. The last thing we want to do on this show is traffic in Russian disinformation spread by QAnon. So we took a pass on that story. 
And that's where things stood until yesterday, when we happened to tune in to a hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Toria Newland was testifying, so we were interested. Newland's one of the people who brought us the Iraq War, never apologized for that, and kept getting promoted, because that's how D.C. works. Tori Newland is now Joe Biden's undersecretary of state in charge of Ukraine, and she knows a lot about Ukraine. In 2014, Tori Newland engineered a coup in Ukraine in the name of democracy, of course. So she is a highly informed source about Ukraine. So she was having this colloquy with Senator Marco Rubio of Florida during her testimony. And at one point, Rubio took a tack that we were not expecting at all. He asked Newland if Ukraine had biological weapons. We never imagined Ukraine would have biological weapons. Why would Ukraine have bioweapons? So it seemed like a pretty strange question, but it wasn't half as shocking as the answer he got. Watch what Toria Newland said. Does Ukraine have chemical or biological weapons? Uh, Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to uh, gain control of. So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. Does Ukraine have biological weapons? Uh, Ukraine has biological research facilities. What? Now, are you seeing now all those articles were, those fact checks were all lies. Because yeah, the woman is confessing. In Senate, she's confessing, yes, they do have this thing. Now, why is men tampering with diseases? Unless they're preparing for another pandemic. China itself, I want you to see China itself is calling out United States for what was found in Ukraine. Over the past two decades, the United States has been blocking the establishment of a verification regime to the Biological Weapons Convention and refused to accept the inspection of biological facilities within and outside its borders. The move has further aggravated the concern of the international community. We once again urge the U.S. to provide full clarification of its biomilitarization activities within and outside its borders and accept multilateral verification. Are you hearing what China is saying? They're calling out America for being involved with these biological weapons, not only inside their own borders, but also outside of their borders. And they say America must be called to an account for what they're doing. So what are we saying? Another pandemic is coming. And it seems as if God delayed your plans in Ukraine because the next disease was gonna spring out from Ukraine, if not Ukraine somewhere else, but it was being developed in Ukraine. And in God's providence, a war breaks out in Ukraine to halt them in their process of releasing this new disease. Very interesting. Before we continue, friends, let us pause and pray and then get into our study. I've not, I've gave you the end of the study. We need to go and rewind now. Those who can, let's kneel. Holy and righteous Father, we come before you, Lord, realizing our great need, realizing our deplorable condition, and that, yeah, Lord, we are all in need of your help. Father, before we have even proceeded further into the study, we acknowledge there's something which is very offensive to you and which is the most hopeless and incurable of all sins, and that is pride. Father, I'm just praying that as we study your word, as we seek to understand how deadly the sin is truly, how truly deadly it is, we also pray that you'll help us to see where's the remedy found. Please, Lord, may you please teach us and instruct us. Help us not to have the sentiments of the Laodicean church when we are told that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We protest against such a declaration and like Peter, we tell Jesus that he has made a mistake, that such is not true. Oh, Father, help us to see our true condition. And I just pray that as we see our true condition, 
as we see how wretched we are truly are, may we flee into that city of refuge, which is Jesus. We are told in Proverbs 18 verse 10 that the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run it into it and are safe. Help us to see our only safety is in Jesus. And please, Lord, I just pray, may what happened to Pilate may not happen to us. May pride never overpower the Spirit of God within our own lives. Please, Lord, this is the sin that closed probation for Pilate. It is the sin that closed probation for Lucifer. And we saw that Job teaches us, your word teaches us, that all the proud Satan is king. He is king of all the children of pride. So, Lord, we do not want him to be king of our lives. We want Jesus to reign supreme within our hearts, within our lives. Please may you teach us, Lord. Please may you instruct us. And we know that pride can be manifested in so many different ways. Not just in one aspect, but in many ways. And I just pray that as we study, Lord, may your spirit touch specifically on idols within our life. Show us where it is that we have a pride of opinion, where it is that pride is fostered within our own lives. And as you touch these idols, Lord, may we submit and allow you to take them out of our lives. Please may you abide with us now and teach us, for we ask these things humbly for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want you to come with me in your Bible. Mm -mm. We went to Daniel. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Now in the book Maranatha, page 174, Daniel chapter 11 we're going to look at. But I'm not going to spend much time here. Daniel chapter 11. In the book Maranatha, page 174, we are told that Maranatha 174, she says, the world is stirred with the spirit of war. What does she say the world is stirred with? The spirit of war. And then she says, the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Then she says, immediately the next sentence, she says, soon strife will break out amongst the nations, which we do not now anticipate. So according to Ellen, Mind's mind, Ellen White's mind, that she's in, 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 in her mind, that she see in Daniel 11 a war that's going to break out amongst the nations. And then she says, it's not going to be an ordinary war. She says, with such intensity that we do not now anticipate. So there's something in Daniel 11, she says, it reveals there's going to be a war. Now, what I'm going to suggest, that Daniel 11, true, it does speak of the papacy. Daniel 11, the king of the north is the papal system. That is true. But the papacy never uses its own power to destroy. It uses other power to destroy. You say, how do you know that? Come with me to Daniel 8. I want you to see Daniel 8 speaking about the king of the north, but using different language, the papacy. I want you to see Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8, I want us to look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Daniel 8, verse 23, speaking about the papacy. It says in Daniel 8, 23, it says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when transgressors are come to the full, a king, speaking about the papal system, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Verse 24. Now watch what's going to happen about this king, the papal system. It says, and his power, and his power shall be mighty. So will the, king of, will the papacy be mighty? Yes, but watch this. But not by his own power. Are you understanding what the Bible is saying? Will the papacy be mighty? But will it be its own power, some other, other, other people's power being used by the papacy? Other people's power. It says, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. According to this verse, does it predict he's going to kill God's people? Yes, Revelation 13, 15, a death decree. Now watch verse 25. I'm going to suggest that he kills through the, through the name of peace. Mm -hmm. He kills through the term of peace. Look at verse 25. 
and through his policy also he shall cause crops to prosper in his hands. He shall magnify himself in his heart and watch this, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of prince, but he shall be broken without hands. According to this verse, how does the papal system kill? Through, through peace. So question, why is the war which the papacy wants is taking place? What do you think the papal system is going to be calling for? Peace. Oh, friends. Do you know that he's calling for peace? But I'm going to show you he is behind the war. Where's my, where's my article? Where's my article? M March 6th, 2022. What did the man of sin say? War's madness. But he, does he believe that? You don't believe that? War's madness, please stop. Pope Francis calls for peace in Ukraine. What does he call for? Peace. But question, what does the Bible say? It'll kill through peace. through peace. So who do you think is behind the war? <laughs> the man of sin. Now coming into Daniel 11, let's look at Daniel 11 a little bit closer. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Review now. Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40. It says, Daniel 11, verse 40. It says, and at the time of the end, are we there? Shall the king of the south push at him? So what the king of the south is going to do to the king of the north? It's going to push at the king of the north. Now the word push doesn't mean to give him a kiss, give him a hug. What does the word push mean? A deadly wound. Remember we looked at it, Exodus 21, 28. A god, this word push is the, actually the, the, the Hebrew word. When you look at it, it's actually when you check it up, the other word applies in the Bible. It translates the same word push in Exodus 21. Go. go. What does, what goes? It says if an ox go a man and he receive a deadly wound. So this word push means you get a deadly wound. So does that imply war? Yeah. It implies war. It implies war. Now, you know what I'm going to do? Let's do this. I'm going to come back to Daniel 11. Because there's, there's, there's things we need to come to get to Daniel 11. I'm going to show you that the purpose of NATO was to make sure that the king of the south never come, that the king of the south gets pushed down and he doesn't ever come into power. I'm going to show you the purpose of NATO. NATO was an arm of the papal system. We're going to show you. They were designed to make sure communism doesn't rise. But I'm going to come back there. Come with me in your Bible. Let's do this. Come with me in your Bible to Luke 21. Let's, I'm coming right back to Daniel. Come with me to Luke 21. Luke chapter 21. We're going to Luke, the 21st chapter. Now, can someone tell me what was Jesus asked in Luke 21? In verse 7. Luke 21, verse 7. What was Jesus asked in Luke 21, verse 7? What? When will, when will what happen? <laughs> when will what happen? You're right. The end of the world. Yes, this is what he was ox. Now, I want us to look at Luke. You know what Luke's going to do? Luke's going to give us exact order of events. And in his order of events, he's going to give us from the year, what I'm going to suggest, he's going to give us from the year, the year 1870. From 1870, he's going to start in 1870. And he's going to take us right to the second coming of Jesus. And inside, from 1870 to the second coming of Jesus, inside there, we're going to see the war that is now about to take place, which started, which is an agitation to the war of Daniel 11:14. Now let's look, at, let's look at Luke 21. Luke 21, verse 26. It says in Luke 21, verse 26. Actually, you know what? Let's start in verse 25. Now before I read verse 25, before I read 25, let me ask you something. When the Bible speaks of prophecy, which this whole book of Luke 21, this whole chapter is about prophecy, what does the Bible liken prophecy to? In, in 2 Peter 1 verse 19, prophecy is like, likened to a light that shines in, dark, in a dark place. So the future for every one of us, how is the future for every one of us? Can we see into the future as a dark? It's dark. Now, prophecy is a light that shines into the darkness. So even though I cannot see into the future, what does prophecy do? Prophecy shines for me into the future and reveals to me beforehand what is to come. But what does Job 10, 22 say? 
If there's no order, what happens to light? Prophecy it becomes darkness. So without any order, in other words, if I just understand prophecy, but I don't understand the order, the Bible says that light or prophecy becomes darkness to me. Now, I want us to understand what inspiration says in Greek Controversy 590, I think it's 598. She says, we have a chart pointing out every way mark on our heavenward journey, and we ought to guess at nothing. So we have a chart, she says, that points out as she says, like, as we are walking, there's a way mark saying, you're, you're, two, you're two meters closer, you're one meter closer. So she says that there's, a, there's way marks on our way to heaven that indicates how close we are to heaven. Now, I want us to see in the book of Luke, does Luke give us these way marks? Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. I want us to start in verse 25. Luke 21, 25. It says, and, be, and there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Verse 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and looking, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Verse 27, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now, I'm going to suggest Luke has given us from verse 25, he gave us events. And he concludes in verse 27 with the second coming of Jesus. Now, I want us to look at this chart that Luke, Luke gives us. Now, and I'm going to suggest that inside this chart, we're going to see the war between the king of the north and king of the south. It's predicted inside this chart. And in this chart, the mark of the beast is predicted there as well. You cannot see it now, but we're going to show you it's there. Now, in this chart, what are the events there? I, I see some of us are drowsy. Just, Please. The sun, the sun, the sun, the sun. The sun. There, there's a chart. So tell me, what is the chart? We, we can't search and just, mm -mm, we need to speak. The sun, the sun. So this is the chart that's going to take us to the end. Speak to me. I see one brother is awake. Brother, speak to me. The <laughs> so there's going to be the signs in the what? The sun, the sun and the moon. And the stars. I'm not going to put the stars with them. Sun, moon, and then we're going to put your stars. And then it says, now this is where I want to zoom in. It says, what does it say? The stress. The stress of what? Of and thank you. The stress of, it doesn't just say the stress of, it says the stress of nations, what perplexity. So you are to see the stress of nations combined with what? Perplexity. Yeah, you'll get the point, perplexity. And then what comes next? Okay, see, and the waves roaring, okay? What comes, okay, men's hearts are failing for fear, for looking for what's coming upon the earth, and what, what? It says the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So let's put here powers of the heavens. Powers of heavens shaken. And then what does he say is the last event? The second coming of Jesus. So this is a chart from this point to the conclusion of the matter, which is the second coming of Jesus. Now, inspiration says in the book Education, my, my question to you is this. What year are we in today? What year is this? What year? 2022. In this chart of 2022, you must be able to pinpoint where we are. You say, why do I say that? Education 178 says, it, the inspiration says, we must be able to pinpoint where we are in the prophetic chart. Education 178, the woman of God says, the history, this is history, which the greater I am has marked out in his word from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, tells us where we are today in the great procession of the ages. She says that all that prophecy has foretold has come into pass can be traced in the pages of history. Let's pause there. She says all that prophecy has foretold has come into pass can be traced in the pages of history. What do you call it when prophecy is now fulfilled? What will you call that? Prophecy, when prophecy becomes fulfilled. Okay, light, thank you. But when prophecy becomes fulfilled, what do you call that? It's history. 
what we look for in the future's prophecy, what we look at in the backers' history. So, in, for example, Daniel predicted in Daniel 2, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome. That was prophecy in Daniel's time. But in my time, that's history. It's not prophecy. Because why? It has been fulfilled. And then she goes on. She says, she says, she says, the history which the great I am has marked out in his word, uniting link of the link in the prophetic chain, from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, shows us where we are today in the great procession of the ages. So she's saying that what God has linked out in his word, she says we can look at this chart that is linked out from eternity in the past to eternity in the future, and we must be able to pinpoint and say this is where we are in this chart. So my question is this, where are we in this chart? In 2022, where would you place us in this chart? <laughs> so you say the stress of nations. You say, so if, if, you, then are you telling me that prophetically, 2022, you're telling me we're standing near the stress of nations? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? What are you saying? But the science. What science? <laughs> we can't be here. We're not yet. What are you saying? Okay, so what I'm hearing, people are saying the stress of nation. So you're saying in 2022, this is where we are standing. Do, I'm, I'm out, do you know what's the powers of the heavens been shaken? What is the power of the heavens been shaken? Let's see publicly. Come with me to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Be, we, before we study what the power of the heavens has been shaken, we must first identify what shakes the power of the heavens. What shakes it? I want us to see Hebrews 12, verse 25 and 26. Tell me what shakes the powers of the heaven. Before we study the shaking, we must first understand what shakes it. Hebrews 12, verse 25 and 26. It says, See that he refused not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Verse 26. Watch verse 26. It says, Whose voice then shook the earth. But now we had promised, saying yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Question, according to this verse, what is the thing that's going to shake heaven? Because it says powers of heaven shaken. What is it that shakes heaven according to this verse? God's voice. So let's write down this. So according to, we all understand what's the power of the heavens been shaken to identify where we are in 2022. And does the Bible predict the war between king of the north, besides Daniel, king of the north, verse king of the south. Now, what shakes the powers of the heavens? Speak to me. Voice. The voice of God. Now, before I go any further, let's see who's good students here. History Bible students. Can you tell us, someone tell us, when was the sun and the moon, when was the sun, when was the sun and the moon affected? And the sun and the moon became darkened because he says there's going to be signs in the sun, in the moon, and then he says, and the stars. When was the sun and the moon affected? Because when you go to Matthew, Matthew says the sun and the moon will be darkened. And the moon shall not give a light. Matthew's, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all speak of these signs. 19th of May when? Speak to me. So this took place 19th May. 1780. Now, this is basic Bible studies. This is basic your elementary studies. We've covered this. So we know definitely we're not in the sun and moon era. We passed 19, the 1780s. When were the stars? When did the stars fall from heaven? Because Matthew says the stars will be fallen. Luke, uh, Dan, uh, John says in Revelation 16, they're going to be shaken from the sky. When were the stars shaken in the sky? Literally every star in the, on, in the sky was moving out of its place. When did this take place? 13th November, when? 13 November, 1833. 1833. So I know for sure we're not in the sun and the moon because we passed 1780. We're not in 1833, we passed it. 
So that means I'm after, I'm somewhere between the stress of nations, powers of the heaven shaken, and the second coming of Jesus. Now, I want us to see, now we are studying the powers of the heaven shaken to identify where we are standing prophetically. Come with me now. What shakes the powers of the heavens? Now come with me to, to Joel. Joel's going to tell me. He's going to give me some light more than the book of Hebrews. Come with me to Joel. Or Joel's going to say it more clearly. Come with me to Joel chapter 3. Daniel, Hosea, and you keep telling, you're going to find Joel. After Hosea's Joel. Joel chapter 3. Joel 3. I want us to see Joel chapter 3, verse 15, verse 16. Are we there? Joel 3, verse 15 and verse 16. It says, the sun, question, is this the same things in the book of Luke? The sun and the moon shall be darkened. Did Luke mention this? And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Did Luke mention this? Yes. And what comes next? It says, the Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter, what's that key word? His voice from where? From Jerusalem. And when he utters his voice, what's going to happen to the earth and the heavens? And the heavens and the earth shall do what? Shall shake. But the Lord will be, be the hope of his people, the strength of the children of Israel. So what, according to Joel, shakes the heavens and the earth? The voice of God. So we see it's the voice of God that's going to shake the heavens and earth. Now this is my question. When is God's voice heard? Now, I, all I know is that God's voice, whenever it is heard, God's little voice is going to shake the heaven and the earth. But my question is, when is God's voice heard? Because when it is heard, whenever it is heard, at where? Very close, but not true. Thank you, mother. Come with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation 16. At where, where did you say his voice is heard? And the seven plague. Let's see that. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation the 16th chapter. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Revelation 16, verse 17. Are we there? Revelation 16, verse 17. It says, And the seventh angel poured out his veil into the air. So this is the seventh plague, right? It's probation closed or it's way closed? Way closed. It's way closed, right? So it says, And the seventh angel poured out his veil into the air. And there came, what is it next? What does it say there? A great voice out of the temple of heaven, out of the temple of heaven, from the throne saying, It is done. Is that the voice of God? Verse 18. And there were voices, thunderings, lightnings, and a great earthquake. Was the earth shaken? Mm -hmm. Such was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. So my question is this. When is the voice of God heard? Speak to me. When is his voice heard? At the seventh plague. Now question, who are the plagues poured upon? That's not a good enough answer. Who are the plagues poured upon? Those have the mark of the beast. Those have the mark of the beast. So the seventh plague comes on those who have the... Now, let's reason together. If the powers of the heavens been shaken as the voice of God at the seventh plague, what does that imply? What must happen before that seventh plague? Think now. The plagues only fall on those who have the mark of the beast. So can there be any plagues if no one has the mark? So question, what must come just before the powers of the heavens been shaken? So just before the powers of the heavens been shaken, I can put it in between the stress of nations and powers of shaken. What must take place? Yes, National Sunday law. So I know I am not yet at the seventh plague for sure. I know we're not yet at the National Sunday law. That means by... I have to be by default, by the distress of nations, what perplexity. According to Luke... Of the distress of nations, whatever it is, I don't know as yet, we're going to study it and see what it is. According to Luke, of the distress of nations with perplexity, what does he say come next? I'm saying in Luke's chart, I'm saying we, we, we reason this chart out. What comes next? National Sunday Law. What does that mean for Seventh-day Adventists? Our probation is about closing. 
no time to prepare. What if I tell you in 2022, we are standing on the brink of the distress of nations with perplexity. Now, what I want us to do, let's look at this phrase, the stress of nations, and let's see how does the Bible use this phrase, the stress of nations. How I'm saying when the Bible uses the stress of nations, what is the context of God using these words, the stress of nations? Come in your Bible to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29. What are we looking at the word? The stress of nations. And then I want us to look at the word perplexity because it's the stress of nations word perplexity. Isaiah 29. Please help me. When the Bible uses the stress of nation, in what context? The stress of nations, Isaiah 29, verse 7. Are we all there? Isaiah 29, verse 7. It says, and the multitude of all, that key word, the nations. So we're talking about nations, right? And then it says that fight against Ariel. Ariel. So it's nations fighting here, right? Even all that fight against her, munition. And that key word, the stressor shall be as a dream of a night vision. Does the Bible use the word? Does it use the words in Isaiah 29, distress? And does it use the word nations? Yeah. What is the context where nations are distress? What's the context here? War. Are you seeing that? The nations are distressed in context of what? War. So question, and when it says distress of nations, what must we understand this to be? War. But question, it can't be any war. No. It says a war that brings what? Perplexity. Now, what does that word perplexity mean? Yes, the stress of nations. What the stress of nations is war. But it says it's war with perplexity. Now, what does the word perplexity mean? Perplexity. Actually, sorry, I shouldn't ask you all. The Greek word. Sorry, yes, the Greek word that translated perplexity. I want you to see what's the word. Yep. There's the word, yeah? This is the Strong's Concordance. There's the word, yeah? Aperio. Do you know what that word means? Does anybody know what that word means? There's a there, there's outline biblical usages. This is what it means. To be without resources. What, 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 what do you say when people don't have resources, food, clothing? What, what will you call that? Petrol. What will you call that? It's a crisis. It's a crisis. Now question, friends. It says here to be without resources. There will be food, clothing, things that you need to survive, resources. Question, what will cause people to be without these things? As if they cannot do what? Afford these things. Now, what in the market, if this thing goes up, everything else goes up? Please speak to me, someone. Please speak to me, someone. Does anybody know which nation pumps the most oil in the world? Russia. Does anybody know what America just stands for Russia? They pronounce sanctions on their oil. If sanction is pronounced on their oil, that means there's not enough oil for the world. Guess what happened to the petrol that is there? Skyrockets. Guess what happens if petrol goes up? Everything, everything, that, you, everything that you can think of goes up as well. You say, why? Because to transport that stuff, you need petrol. The stress of nations, that's a war that brings about a financial issue for the world. Immediately following that National Sunday law, I wonder if you are seeing this today. I wonder if you are on the brink of this. I want you to see this. It says, yeah, Biden, now interesting, Daniel 11 verse 40, says that the king of the north is going to come against the king of the south, he's going to use two things, ships and horsemen. Can you remember we studied it for almost how many weeks? What does ships represent? Economy, sanctions, sanctions. 
It says here, Biden blocks Russian's oil imports in latest round of sanctions on Kremlin. Again, Russia-Ukraine war, oil prices increase, chance of a what? A recession. Again, Russia's war in Ukraine has driven up gas prices. Will rising oil costs increase, increase food prices next? How Russia oil prices will change the world as we know it. I'm giving you an article of the article of the article telling you the world cannot be the same. That this war is going to affect every part of the world. The stress of nation war with perplexity. People are going to be in need, of, basically, without resources. Why? They can't afford it. I want you to see what's happening. The United States has banned all imports from Russia over the war in Ukraine. Within a day, the ripple effect is now starting to show. Oil prices are at a 14-year high. Cost of oil per barrel has reached a whopping $140 a barrel. And Russia is now threatening retaliation. So the U.S. is hunting for alternatives. The US so what is the U.S. now doing? They're looking for what? Alternatives. Now, the only place they can now go to is the uh, EAU, United Arab Emirates. Iran. But do you know what? They have issues with them. Biden called them, and guess what? To try and get a meeting with them, they have ignored his calls. Guess who they've been speaking with? Mr. Putin. Because all oil companies are together. He is the second to Russia as the EAU, United Arab Emirates, and they're in connection. And they declined Biden's of Biden's Biden basically called them to help pump more oil so because they sanctioned Russia, but they're not doing it. They're not doing it. So if they're not going to listen and pump more oil, guess what's going to happen to oil prices? They're going to have to go more up. He was looking to drop the prices by getting them to pump more oil, and they say, nope. You, you say, but why, why won't they do that? They don't want the prices to drop. They're also businessmen. The love of money the root of all evil. As President Joe Biden knocked on Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates doors, but all he received was a cold shoulder. The two leaders declined requests to even take his calls or arrange calls. Instead, they held calls with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Experts say that the two Gulf nations are regarded as the only global suppliers to pump enough oil to ease the price surge. OPEC is a group of countries that majorly exports oil to the world. So the West requested the bloc to pump up production, but the US left empty-handed, and that's because Russia, a member of OPEC, immediately declined the request. What did they do? They declined the request. But question, why did the EAU, why did they decline it? Because Russia is a part of, there's a pack that the oil companies have come together, and Russia says, you will not pump more oil. And because it's a part of that pact, they're not going to pump more oil. Will that effect, will it even come and affect you? Yeah? Oh, yes. It's going to affect the entire world. We might not yet feel the pinch. United States already feeling the pinch. But it's coming, yeah. It's coming, yeah, friends. And if that goes up, everything goes up. And then it says, what, it says the stress of nations with perplexity. What does perplexity mean? To be without resources. It becomes hard to get food becomes hard to get clothing. Were we ever instructed to go into the country and grow our own food? For in the future, the problem of what? Buying and selling will be a very serious one. We are, we are getting there. Now, coming to Daniel 11, 40, I want us to come to the conclusion now of this thing. Daniel 11, verse 40. Daniel 11, verse 40. Some review, conclude, yeah, look at some signs, and then remember... We, are ish we can't be studying the signs when we haven't yet come with the cure for pride. Amen. Daniel 11. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11. I want us to see Daniel 11 verse 14. It says, speaking about the king of the south, it says, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. Who is the him there that the king of the south is going to push against? The king of the north. Now, who is the king of the, who is the, king of the north? The papal system. Who is the king of the south? Can you remind me, king of the south? China. China and Russia. Amen. But how do you get to that conclusion? Powerful. How did you get to the conclusion? Literally, which, which, which? Egypt was the 
literally, I'm saying the headquarters of Egypt literally was one of, one of um, Alex, Alexander's generals. He took that part. Alexander's generals, basically there were four generals that came. But when you study Daniel 11 and mentions two generals, eventually from the four, two come up victorious. One was called king of the north, one was called king of the south. And the one who was called king of the south occupied the territory of Egypt. Literally occupied Egypt. Now what did Egypt stand for spiritually? Exodus 5 verse 2. Who was Jehovah that I should let Israel go? I know not Jehovah. Neither will I let Israel go. That, a person who says, I don't know, I don't believe in the existence of Jehovah, that's an atheist. So when it says that the king of the south, this is now spiritual king of the south. When it mentions king of the south, it's speaking about atheistic communistic nations that are going to attack the king of the north, the papacy. I'm not going back to review this, we've covered this. But does the papacy take this, with a, does the papacy just take this from the king of the south? Or does it retaliate? It retaliates. So what I'm going to say is Daniel 11:40. the first part is fulfilled. The king of the north, the Catholic church has already received its deadly wound. Watch here. 1798. But then it says after 1798, what must take place? The king of the north shall come against him. That's the king of the south. Like a wild one with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So according to Daniel 11.40, Will the king, of the, the king of the north come against the king of the south? Yes. Now speak to me. Let's do this quickly. King of the north. Which system is it? Papacy. Mm -hmm. King of the south today. Who is the king of the atheistic nations, communistic nations? There's two of them primarily. It's Russia and who else? China. Russia and China. So is there going to be a war against the papacy and Russia and China? Yes. But question, is it going to be papacy using its own might, which it doesn't really have, or is it going to use the might of others? It's going to use, it says, it's going to use horses and what else? And ships. I'm not going to the verses. We've covered this in our previous studies. What is ships? Economy. You want a verse for us to learn for ships? Economy. Proverbs 31. Give us, give us Proverbs 31. Give us the verse. Quote it off your mind. Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31. What does it say? Proverbs 31, 14. Ships. So what do ships represent? Merchandise. Merchandise. So how will the papacy come against Russia and China? Through ships. What are ships? Economy. Merchandise. But then it also says horses. What is horses? We study this. War. Physical war. Now, speak to me. Speak to me, economy and, and which nation is the most powerful nation, military? Speak to me, USA. Economy, which is the most power, one of the most powerful economies in the world? Germany. Germany. Now, what is Germany a part of? And USA, what are they both parts of? So what will the papacy use to overthrow Russia and China? It's going to use NATO. Are you following, friends? Is this Bible? What if I show you that that's the purpose of NATO? I'm saying, what if their documents, NATO's documents say, is to overthrow communism? Would you believe me? Yeah, friends, Bible says <laughs> the king of the north is going to use Germany and the United States to overthrow Russia and China. Because it says through war, most powerful nation to do this has to be the United States. It says through economy, the only, one of the nations, the strongest economy is Germany. So, and Germany and the United States is a part of a, form, a, 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 a alliance called NATO. What if I tell you that NATO was designed, the original design was to overthrow communism, which Russia and China is the king of the south, which is communism. Let me show you that. Friends, this thing is sweet. You can't see it, but to me it's sweet. Watch this thing. First things first, what is NATO? The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a security alliance between North America and Europe. It was formed after the Second World War. The goal, they say, was to protect democratic freedom. On the 4th of April 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty was signed. This treaty was simply an anti-Soviet accord aimed at countering any future aggression by the USSR. It established a new balance of power in Europe. It promised all members collective security. 
That's a core principle laid out in Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. It obliges member states to protect each other in case of a war. It says an armed attack against one ally will be an attack on all allies. Meaning, if one NATO nation is attacked, all NATO nations will retaliate. This allowed NATO members to pool and share their military resources. They built efficient defense capabilities, but there was more to NATO than just defense. It was an alliance of liberal countries, an engine of democratization that was supposed to promote common values and interests. Also push back against the rise of communism. Did you hear that? What was NATO to push it back against? Communism. And it was a pack of nations, most of Europe, the European nations and United States of America, they have aligned themselves to push back against communism. Which two nations? China and Russia. The NATO was designed, their whole purpose was to make sure communism never puts its head up. Overthrow communism. Does the Bible say that was a place? Friends, I just think it's How accurate is the word of God? You'll only see the sweetness of the steam. I see it. Now, I want you to see. How did I get to this? The war in Ukraine has not even completed a fortnight. But okay, yes. Now, tell me something. As this war in Ukraine is taking place, is it causing the alliance between China and Russia to become stronger? Yes. Watch this. The war in Ukraine has not even completed a fortnight, but a diplomatic fallout is already in the making. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi has called his country's relationship with Russia ironclad, offering strong support to Russia. At an annual press conference, the Chinese Foreign Minister lauded Russia. Wang Yi called Russia the most important strategic partner. He also condemned the West's naked double standards, as he put it, on China's territorial claims towards Taiwan. Listen in. The friendship between Chinese and Russian people is rock solid. There is a bright prospect for cooperation between the two sides. No matter how precarious and challenging the international situation may be, China and Russia will maintain strategic focus and steadily advance our comprehensive strategic partnership of coordination for a new era. You hear what they're saying? That the, the, the alliance or actually rock, is actually said rock solid now. Rock solid. Friends, I, you know, I, I, like I, I'm just going past this thing and you're not seeing the sweetness. The Bible predicts unites that the king of the north is going to use military power, horses, and economy, which has to be United States and Germany. They are pawns of NATO to overthrow the king of the south. God's word said it. And I'm showing you literal facts where it says NATO is purposely designed to make sure communism doesn't exist. Like I, I'm saying, Lord, how perfect can these things align? Friends, you can't see it, but I, I, I'm seeing the, uh, this thing is beautiful. But the next thing after this thing, the stress of nations with perplexity, God says expect a National Sunday Law. Someone says, no, National Sunday Law is not next because we're studying Daniel 11. I'm now taking you to Luke. But, Luke yeah. says National Sunday Law. Yes. That's why it says, through peace, yeah. it destroys many. So he comes before the world, I'm the man of peace, but behind closed doors. He's saying, make the war. You're having meetings. Now, let, let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you that Biden, he was trained for his position to make, to agitate Russia, to invade Ukraine, and then for NATO to go to war with them. He was designed for that. Watch this thing. Given the events of the past two weeks, Russia's warnings for NATO to halt expansion towards its territory seem to have been all but forgotten. But they were acknowledged by the West more than two decades ago when the current US president warned that NATO expansion into Eastern Europe could provoke Russia. I think the one... Does anybody know who's this man? The young Biden. <laughs> this is the, your, your, your young Biden. By the way, what year is this? 1997. Yeah, what he has to say. Place where the greatest consternation would be caused in the short term would be to admit the Baltic states now in terms of NATO Russian US Russian relations. Are you hearing what he's saying? What would cause the greatest consternation? As if NATO adopts the Baltic nations, which will include Ukraine, into NATO, it will cause the greatest consternation with Russia. This is in 1997. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped, 
in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction. I don't mean military in Russia. It would be that. 1997, he said that will make Russia hostile if we adopt these nations into NATO. 1997. Now watch it. Watch it now. Joe Biden, president elect at last was shaped by a very American Catholic faith. You don't understand this thing. You don't understand this thing. It says in spring of what year? 1980. Watch what happened. Pope John Paul II, you, that's, you know who's this man, right? John Paul II had one of the longest meetings of his fledging papacy. Who was this? He had the longest meetings. Who was it? Who was it? In the 1980s. It, was, it wasn't worth a world leader. No, no. A US president, no. Or even a secretary of state, no. It was none of that. It was what a 37 year old Joe Biden, a US senator, barely a year into his second term. The Pope shooed away the Vatican aid several times when they, when they attempted to interrupt the 45 minute conversation. After waving them out of the room, John Paul pulled his chair out from behind his desk to sit closer to Biden. Are you understanding these things, friends? This was all in the making. This current war, it was all in the making. Now, I want you to hear Mr. Biden speak about the Catholic Church. By the way, if you go on the internet and you look for this video, it's a Jesuit interviewing him. Now, he is a Catholic. He's been interviewed by a Jesuit. Please, go back and I've got the video for you. Go back and watch the video. It's, it's a Jesuit priest interviewing him. Now, hear what he says about the Pope. The thing I love about this Pope, I got to meet him when I went to his, uh, quote, inauguration. I always thought it was an installation, but right. the inauguration. Where was he? He went to the Pope's what? Inauguration. When the Pope was becoming Pope, he was there for his inauguration. The great pleasure of representing the United States of America. My sister was with me, and I sat in the altar. And afterwards, as you know, Father, you line up an alphabetical order in the basilica, and the Holy Father stands at the foot of the altar, and he greets every head of state or acting head of, or the, acting for the head of state. The United States were at the very end, and so I walked up, and there was a wonderful Irish Monsignor who had sat in with me in a long interview that or discussion I had with Pope Benedict just several months earlier. And uh, he turned, he said, oh, Mr. Vice President, he said. Are you, you see now for his going, John Paul II, Benedict, and Pope Francis. Every Pope that has become Pope, he had a meeting with them. Trained. He said, you know, uh, Holy Father. And the Pope reached out like this and he grabbed my hand. He said, I know, Mr. Vice President, you're always welcome here. That is the message he's sending to the world. That, and that is the tone he's striking everywhere, isn't it? Absolutely. He is, that's why he's the single most popular figure in the world today. And not just in Catholic nations, across the board. Who's the most popular man? And that's why he loves the Pope, the man of sin. He loves the man of sin. He loves him. Biden's inaugura inauguration, when he was inaugurated, well, when he was, Features what? Catholic signs, symbolisms. On a what Bible? A Jesuit Bible. Who, in, who, who was the one that praised the inauguration prayer? A Jesuit priest. Who was inaugurated? A Catholic president. And by the way, when a man prays, do you know who he prays to? Does anybody know who he prays to? He prays to the Pope. He asks the Pope's blessing upon the United States of America. He concludes his prayer with the Pope. Not in the name of Jesus, but in the name of the Pope. He had dedi on that day, when Biden was inaugurated, he dedicated America to the man of sin. Now every Jesuit, when they saw this, they knew that America is ours. We have accomplished our mission. It says here, Je Jesuit priest, there's the priest there, invokes Pope Francis during what? presidential inauguration as Biden is sworn into office on a what? On a Jesuit Bible. Maybe the man is even a Jesuit, not just a Catholic. We don't know. He could be a Jesuit. He's deep levels. 
He was trained and educated from the 1980s for his position today. And what is a Jesuit oath? I'm not reading this, but what is a Jesuit oath? There's their oath they take with a knife in their hand. What a knife in the hand. Even in this oath it says, I will kill mother, I'll kill brother, I'll kill sister. I will kill even, even pledges to kill himself should he become against the man of sin. If ever, he, he, his life must go. He has one goal is to promote the, 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 the agenda of the man of sin. But what is the first sentence in their decree, in their oath? I furthermore promise to declare that I will do what? When opportunity presents, what does he say he's going to make? Make and wage relentless what? War. war. The Biden agitated war. He agitated a war. I'm not reading the old thing. Pope, man of sin. Now, some of us might think Putin is mad. But Putin is saying that NATO is going against the agreement. You say, what do you mean? After Germany fell, World War II, after World War II, there were some issues, and then what happened was there was a pledge made that if Germany was allowed into NATO, NATO would not expand further towards Russia. That would be the last nation ever. But you know that they failed on their promise. They adopted more and more until they're now on the borders of Russia. I'm saying by adopting nations into NATO. And until they're on the border, and, and, and Putin's looking and saying, you're... Yeah, yeah, you're coming so close to me, you'll pledge you're not going to come further to Russia. Now you're literally coming on my borders. And that means that if you should ever have in the future a war with Ukraine, United States steps in. Every nation of NATO steps in, and he knows he's going to fight a losing battle. So to prevent that, he's trying to stop that by, by actually changing the government of Ukraine. He says he wants to demilitarize Ukraine. But unfortunately, we're going to see a war. United States is already making war. We'll explain that. Watch the video. U.S. government under George H.W. Bush made an offer to Russian President Mikhail Gorbachev. It suggested if Germany became a NATO member, NATO would stop expanding, not one inch eastwards. No new members. Today, the U.S. says it made no such promise, that no such deal was ever struck, but hundreds of memos, meeting minutes, and transcripts from U.S. archives indicate otherwise. Are you, are you hearing this? NATO had pledged years ago that if Germany becomes a part of them, they no more expand. And Putin is saying they're going against it now because they've taken so many nations in. And when he was asked, can Russia join NATO? They refused, they declined. So he says that if they do not want me as a friend, that means they want me as an enemy. That means NATO's goal and purpose is to overthrow communism and their goal is to attack Make sure Russia is overthrown and then next China. Mm. Now they, they want to deal with Russia. So, sorry? They have, to make him they have to. They have to, yes. They have to. Now, I want to come to the conclusion of the matter. I, I'm going to tell you that Russia is not doing well. Economy. I'm saying the sanctions on Russia is bad. It is crippling Russia. Mm. Literally, I'm saying they are making war against Russia. I, I, they are warring against Russia, not so much through military, I'm saying these nations, NATO, but they're making a war. They, I'm saying the ruby has almost a hundred and something rubies. Now, one dollar, one United States dollar is over a hundred rubies. The uh, ruby is becoming almost worthless. Same thing. Now, <laughs> What I want us to do, I want to come now, or before I'm concluding my study, or you'll see where we are standing prophetically, friends. What is the greatest issue we, God is identifying? Pride. pride. Who was Lucifer king over? All the children of pride. What was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed for homosexual pride? What is the most offensive sin to God? Pride, most incurable pride. What is the problem with the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Us, pride. Jesus says, this is how you are. You say, no, I'm not like this. What I want us to do, I want us to look at this. Come in your Bible to Malachi 4. I want us to, I want us to look, we're coming to the conclusion. Malachi 4, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4 verse 1. Can someone read Malachi 4? When God says he's going to burn all the wicked, 
What word does he use for everyone outside the city in Malachi 4 verse 1? What is the word that he uses? Oh, you seen that? All oh, right, read it. What, what does God say when all the wicked are burned? What does he call them? The all the proud. Yea, and all that do wickedly shall be as stubble. The day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root. Who is the root of pride? Satan. Satan. And who is the branches? His children. All his children are the branches. Everyone who clings to pride. Everyone who clings to pride. So what God is saying, he's saying that everyone who's lost outside my, everyone who's not, don't make it in. One problem they all had in harmony, maybe this person is their homosexuality, this person their lust, this person, whatever. What does God say they all have in common? Don't they have different sins? He says they are all children of pride here. So if God wants to remedy the problem with me, what is he going to deal with? Pride. Pride. Remember Proverbs 16? I want you to see what Proverbs 16 says. Before a person commits sin, what is the thing that comes up first within their hearts? <laughs> you guess, you know, do you know that? <laughs> Come with me to Proverbs 16, let's see. Proverbs 16, verse 18, you are right. <laughs> you are right. Proverbs 16, you can read it for us. Should I? Proverbs 16, loud, so we can, people can yarn on the camera. Proverbs 16, verse 18. What does it say? Before a person commits sin, before they are destroyed, what must go before them? Mm. So before a person can be destroyed, what does God say they must first have? They must have pride. So pride goes before destruction. And when somebody is proud, they are haughty. A haughty spirit before a fall. So no one commits sin without, without first being proudful. Pride must be in the heart before sin is committed. Pride of opinion, pride of anything, pride. Pride is, yes, he's the father of the children of pride. Now, I want us to see this quotation. I want us, oh, friends, I got so much. I'm going to skip this. Oh, there's more things, but let's come to this. Volume 5. God does not record what? All sin with equal magnitude. He doesn't do that. It says, yeah, there are degrees of guilt in his estimation as well as in that of finite men. Friends, you say, but that's unfair. How can God not record all sins of equal magnitude? You think of this. You think if this is fair. There's a man comes to court. He got caught stealing cheese. And there's a man who's a mass murderer. Will the judge say, I'm giving you a both life sentence? Boom. No. Is that fair? No. According to the crime must be the time. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise with God. According to the, I'm saying if we in our human mind cannot both men get the same sentence, no, it's unfair. Likewise with God. Now watch the, watch the quotation. But I want you to understand no matter what's the sin, a sin is sin. <laughs> but however trifling, this or that wrong in their, co in, in their course may seem in the eyes of men, no sin is what? Small in the sight of God. The sins which men Sorry, the sins which man is disposed to look upon as small may be the very ones which God accounts as, the great, as, as great crimes. Watch this. The drunkard is despised and he is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven. While pride, number one. Selfishness, we studied last week, number two. And covetous, number three. Go unrebuked. But these are the sins that are especially offensive to God. He resisted the proud. And Paul tells us that covetousness is idolatry. So according to inspiration, what sins, according to inspiration, are especially offensive to God? Number one, pride and covetousness. These three sins. Actually, Paul says in the last days, 2 Timothy 3 verse 1, perilous time shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own what? Selves. What would you call being lovers of your own self? Selfishness. Proud. Pride. Boasters. Blasphemers. Disobedience. It goes on. But he mentions two main sins. Selfishness and pride. 
These are the sins inspiration says are especially offensive to God. Now, I, this, is, this is what's going to happen in your mind. The temptation, Lord, go and we pray, Lord, I could be proud. I could, I could have pride in my heart. She says that that's possible to go to God and say, Lord, I could be a proud person. I'm proud, Lord. But she says the heart, in that confession, the heart is swelling with its own conceit of its superior righteousness. Why it's making a confession to God, she says it's possible that the heart can be swelling with its own conceit of superior righteousness. You say, then where's my safety? Look at the quotation. I'm telling you, your safety is in this message. The loud cry of the, th- of the third angel, which is the fourth angel. It says, but we must, actually, you know what? Let's keep that. Let's go straight to the red words. She says, the lips may express, what may the lips express? A poverty of soul. That means the lips may express, Lord, I, 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 poverty stricken. My soul is poverty stricken. I am proud. I'm selfish. I'm covered. Like you're telling God, Lord, this is who I am. She says, the lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. Like, yeah, you could be like, yes. So she's saying, yeah? You don't know, yes, yes. Same with, same with us. We might come with, with our lips. Lord, I'm proud. I'm selfish. I'm covetous. But she says, the lips is telling God that, but the heart does not acknowledge. The heart is saying, Mm-mm, I'm not proud. I'm not selfish. Mm-mm, not me. But the lips is saying it. She continues, while speaking to God of poverty of spirits, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. So she's saying it's possible. We can be praying to God, saying, Lord, I, I'm, I'm like this. Ah. But she's saying the heart is not acknowledging that. And you know what pride says? Paul says, what pride does, it compares itself amongst each other. Like, uh, you, your goodness is based upon someone's badness. The worse they look, the better you appear in your own eyes. Remember the Pharisee, Lord, I thank thee. And I'm not like this man. Oh, Lord, this man is like this, he's like that, he's like that. I don't do those things. And because he's so bad, I look so good. So the more people you can look at who is bad, the more better you appear. For your own deceit and mine. <laughs> So, are you seeing what's pride, friends? Now, what is the remedy for this dangerous, deadly thing? Which, even if I'm praying, inspiration is saying the heart is not acknowledging it's proud. But remember, we read the Holy Spirit is a mighty agency, but we saw that pride overpowered the Holy Spirit. And I say that reverently. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to suggest the solution is found in Revelations 18, the loud cry of the third angel. Huh? <laughs> no, no, no. Loud cry of the third angel. Come in your Bible to Revelations 18. Huh? Let's see. Revelations 18. Revelation chapter 18. We conclude in just four more verses to conclude this thing. A few more verses. Did I say four? I said, I mean, few. <laughs> Revelations 18. Now, the people are going to fight it. If you tell me, they want to see the whole study. Revelations 18, verse 1, <laughs> verse 2. Let's see what it says. Actually, let's just read verse 1. It says in Revelations 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel. This is that fourth angel, that mighty angel, come down from heaven, having great power and then it says and the earth was lightened with his glory now i'm gonna pause right there i'm gonna pause right there i want us to look at this fourth angel it says when he comes down it says that the whole earth is going to be affected by what it says glory now my question is what is this because when this thing comes down the whole earth's going to be affected powerful you okay you okay you okay me the conclusion of the matter but that's not where I'm going directly. That is right. I'm getting there, but I'm not going there. Doom. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Powerful, 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 powerful. 
Now, I want us to see glory. Come with me in your Bible. What is glory linked to it? Because it says when this angel comes down, the whole earth is going to be impacted by glory. Thousands upon thousands, we are told that this message is going to convert thousands. That means when this message comes, Okay, but watch this thing. Something specific. You are right. You are giving me a broad picture, but I'm zooming in something specifically. Come with me in your Bible. Let's see. Come with me to Exodus. Amen. 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 Come with me to Exodus. Exodus. Exodus chapter 33. What is God's glory synonymous with? Is that's it? It's his name. Exodus 33, verse 18 and 19. Exodus 33. Verse 18 and verse 19. It says in 18, it says, Moses speaking, it says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. So Moses wanted to see God's glory. Now look at God's response in verse 19. It says, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And then he says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Pause. What was God asked for? His glory. But what did God say he's going to reveal to Moses? His what? His name. So can I say that God's glory, because this fourth angel comes and the old earth's affected with God's glory. Can I say that God's glory is his name? Yes. Now, I want to look at this. That's it. I want to look at his name. And I want you to see that God's name, when someone understands God's name, not, not name Jehovah, that, that is God's name, but it's more than that. It's not just his name, name. Character. It's his character, that's true, because if you read it's going to explain it's his character. So when I understand God's name or his character, tell me, because God's glory is synonymous with his name, which is his character, because you can keep reading verse 5 and 6. It says the Lord proclaimed his name. And the Lord is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundance in goodness. That's his character. So God's name is basically, we can put in brackets, his character. It's his character. But when I understand his character, or his name, or his glory, tell me what comes inside of me. Something comes in me when I understand God's name, or when I understand his, his character. Come with me to John 17. We are reading this in devotion. And I saw it. And the whole study was born to this one verse. John 17. As I said in devotion, I said, Lord, should I share it? And that day I just kept quiet. I said I'm not commenting because I might go too far. <laughs> I'll remain silent. <laughs> John 17. John chapter 17. I want you to see John 17. I saw it when we read the last verse. When I understand God's name, tell me what comes inside of me because the loud cry, when it's proclaimed and those who embrace it, call, this would come inside of them. John se- Oh, thank you. John 17 verse 26. It says, I have declared unto them, what is that key word? Thy name, which we are looking at, God loud cry. And will declare it. Now, why is Jesus declaring to us God's name? Why is he doing that? He says, I'm doing that, that the love, where thou hast loved me, may be in them and I in them. When I understand God's name or God's character, what comes inside of me? Love. Is love. So speak to me. The fourth angel is a message of what? What does it bring? It's a message of what? It's a message of love. You t- question, am I telling you that the last message that God gives to the world is a message of love? I'm not telling you. I'm, I, it's a guaranteed fact. Look at this quotation. She says, this is Christ's object lessons 415. She says, the last rays of mercy for light. The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his Character of what? Love. Of love. Give me another word for character. Another word for character. Name. His name. Another name for name. Glory. What does she say is the last demonstration of God for the world to win them over? His character of love. Now here's the question that you should ask. Why would the lost message, the loud cry message be a revelation of his love? Like out of everything God could have chosen, he says the final message for this world, the last rays that I'm going to allow to shine as I want them to understand my character of love. That's what she says. That's what the Bible says, loud cry. You might, you might ask, why? Why, Lord, love? Why love? Oh, by the way, unless you think I'm going off righteousness by faith, righteousness is what? 
So I'm not off the topic. We're still on the topic, but we're dealing with love, which is like righteousness, which is another word. Now, someone says, but why love, Lord? Why would you use love in the fourth angel's message? Why would that be it, Lord? Why? There's the quotation, and there's the solution. Why love? God does not employ what? Compulsory measures. Does God use, does God use force? No. God does not employ compulsory measures. What does he use? Love is the agent which he uses to do what? To expel sin from the heart. So if God wants sin out of your heart, what will he use to get it out? He uses love. But watch what love does. What are we dealing with? What is the greatest incurable sin? Watch what love does. By it. What's the it? No. By it. What's the it? Love. By it, he changes pride into humility and enmity and unbelief into love and faith. Tell me, what does God use to remove pride and bring in humility? The most incurable sin is love. That's why the loud cry message is a message of love. It's a revelation of the character of God's love. It's not just a message. Yes, it's a message of his love, but it's a demonstration of that love. If God wants to cure you from pride, according to this quotation, what will he use? He's going to use love. He, he, actually, I'm going to tell you, God got nothing else to use. If he wants pride out of us, and remember all the wicked outside are proudful, but demonstrated in different sins. So question, if you are struggling with sin, it might be, I'm just saying, homosexuality, what did God say is the root of that? Pride. It might be, you name the sin. What is the root of it? Pride. In Sabbath school we had, to solve all family issues, how many minutes? Five minutes. If people will lay aside two things, pride and what else, selfishness, can be resolved within five minutes. Five minutes, all it takes, she says. Now, there's also something that Satan uses unmeaningful. After someone's preached, after someone prays a prayer, moved by the Spirit of God to utter those words, someone shares a verse, powerful verse, stirred by the Spirit of God, Satan uses that opportunity to inculcate pride within the person who done that thing. How does he do that? Watch. We need to shun everything that would encourage pride and self-sufficiency. Therefore, we should be aware of giving or receiving flattery or praise. It is Satan. It is Satan's work to flatter. He deals in flattery as well as in accusing and condemnation. So what does she say that we should be aware of giving or receiving praise or flattery. What does it do? She says it encourages pride. We should never come and, she says, don't do things like that. Actually, she goes on, she says, she says, thus, he seeks to overcome, he seeks to walk the ruin of the soul. And then she says, those who give praise to men are used by Satan as his agents. So when you come and you praise someone for that wonderful prayer, or you praise them for that sermon, or that verse that they shared, she says you've been an agent of the devil. Yeah. Don't utter a word to him. Oh, powerful. Mm -mm. Tell God, Lord, thank you. It was powerful. I was convicted. Without knowing. We, we didn't know. Uh, yeah. 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 We don't mean, people don't mean that. But inspiration is saying, don't do it. You are you're endangering the man. You try, you, pride will come up in his heart. That, that, that's, making, that's encouraging pride. That's why when someone sings, we should never clap. Because you are clapping, and the person, guess what? You bring in temptation. You are in their heart now to be proudful. I'm the best singer here. Mm. Never clap. You say, Amen, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You owe you every word. You go to God. Praise God. Not to the individual. Because it's God's talent. It's not their talent. They're just a vessel. It says, let the workers for Christ direct every word of praise away from it themselves. 
So she says, if someone unknowingly, they must just direct it to God, praise God. Direct, if, if praise comes, they must just poof, push it to God, praise be to God for that. We thank God for that. She says, Christ, red words, Christ alone is to be exalted. Only person to be exalted must be Jesus. Must be Jesus. Now remember, we read this quotation, that the lips might be expressing a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. But then she says, what is the solution? She says, same red words I read, I'm not reading again, underline words. She says, in one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. How? We must be old who? We must be old Christ. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, glad in the commons of self-righteousness. And like every other sinner, we shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. Why, she says, are men full of pride? Who are they not looking at? They're not looking at Jesus. And not looking at Jesus can cause pride. Friends, do you know it's possible for men to have understanding of many wonderful truths in the Bible, but they can be full of pride? You know why? They're studying all these many wonderful things, but they're not looking at Jesus. And I remember I spoke to one man who seemed to be very, and I was still new in the faith. Hey, the man had many things memorized. And I'm saying, when I saw people do these things, and I'm a new person, I'm saying, sure, these people really study. I want to also study like that. But then I asked them, I said, I read in Desire Ages, Ellen White says, a thoughtful hour. And the person said to me, very studious, very, seems that he loved God, very intelligent concerning the Bible, spirits of prophecy. He said, to, this is his own, he told me. He says, if I do that, I won't have time to study other things. When he said that I knew, man, this man is standing on dangerous ground. And I, 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 the man is in heresy now. Deep, deep heresy. Why? He had many, understanding many wonderful things, but he left out that which was core to all those things. It was Jesus. Jesus. I conclude. I conclude. In Desire Vages 661. Friends, let me ask you this. If you don't want something to grow, like can you see some of the plants there? The water seems to be drowning them. I'm saying in that environment, can any seed grow? No. Do you know Ellen White says there's an environment that pride can never grow in? She says this like she says, it's an impossible thing to do for pride to exist in such an environment. Like a seed growing in a place full of water. Do you know what environment she says? Look at the blue words. She says pride and self-worship, that selfishness, cannot flourish. Flourish means grow. Cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the sins of Calvary. What is she saying? If I constantly spend time looking at Jesus dying on Calvary, she says, pride, self-worship cannot exist. It cannot flourish in the heart. Why then is it flourishing in our hearts? We are not looking at Jesus. We are looking at many things, but we are not looking at Jesus. That's the only thing to kill it. Against, yes. This thing will... And like, friends, it's possible to be, have pride of religion. The Pharisees were they proudful in their deceits. They thought there's none like them, but they were deceived. And the question, someone says, but I'm in a country, then you're the best person to be proud for. You say, why do you say that? Because other people are not here. Mm -hmm. I'm here, they're still playing in the cities. And then what comes, no, I'm better. I'm a better Adventist. I take the message serious, but there you got pride in your heart. Are you seeing how dangerous it is? It lurks wherever, there's no, you, none of us are safe. We can't escape it. Yeah. Our only remedy is the, the man of Calvary. The only remedy for pride is Jesus. Is Jesus. There's more, but I think we got the point. Do we understand what we studied, friends? 
We can't be studying and studying and studying. We need to take these things serious. Who wants to make a covenant with God today and say, Lord, I need help. I need help. I need help. I need help. Those who can, let us, let us reverently kneel. Loving Father, Lord, we just come before you and Lord, we even realize that even our words we cannot trust. Lord, because you see more than our words, you see our hearts. Father, we all might have different issues we are struggling with, but we have just seen in our study that the root of it all is pride. And Lord, we are helpless against this giant. Even though we might do the right things like the Pharisees, our hearts could be full of pride. We might return tight, we might fast, we might do all the religious duties which heaven requires, but we can be very proudful in doing these things. Father, we could even take the message of country living very serious, but then look down upon those who have not yet embraced it. Lord, we just ask in please to help us, for we cannot help ourselves. We are here hopeless if left to ourselves, but we are truly thankful that again you have shown us the remedy for this deadly disease. Thank you so much, Father, that there is a remedy for the sin sick soul, and that remedy is in Jesus, precious Saviour. Father, we saw last week that it was not only the remedy for pride as we saw this week, but even the remedy for selfishness. We saw it as we behold you, dying suspended between heaven and earth. As we see the blood drops flowing from your hands, your feet. As we see the sweat stinged with blood standing upon your brow. Lord, as we see these things, it will cause us to fall prostrate before you, pleading for help. Lord, please help us. Please expel pride from our hearts and bring humility within our hearts. Please, Father, we need your help. And we are asking to please, Lord, deliver us from all selfishness, from all pride. Help us, to, Lord, to heed the words of Malachi, or rather Micah chapter 6, where he says that, What doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Help us, please, Lord, to walk humbly with thee. Please forgive us where we have exhibited pride within our lives, and we are asking from this point, Lord, may you uproot this deadly disease, this deadly, incurable, almost incurable disease pride. Thank you so much, Lord, for loving us. Thank you again for revealing these truths to us that we might flee into the city of refuge. Please abide with us throughout the remaining of these holy hours, Lord. And even as we go through this day, may our minds contemplate the truths we have learned. May Satan not snatch up these truths for we are told in Matthew 13 that immediately after the seeds of truth is caused, that if our hearts are not going to absorb them, the birds come and snatch up the seeds. And we know that that represents Satan. So please, Lord, help us to meditate upon what we have learned and even to speak to you about what we have learned today. Oxen, how, Lord, can we come closer to you? And I just seek a deeper experience with you. Thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for... Yeah, all your, your love towards us and thank you for ministering to our hearts from morning until now. We love you, Father, and we are so, so grateful for the gift of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful gift. We love you and we pray all these mercies humbly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Someday the silver cord will break and I know more as now shall sing, but all oh, the joy when I shall wake within the palace of the king, and I shall see him face to 